My subject is from Human Nature Companionship to Green Consumerism, which is at least the working title of my dissertation as well. And I'm looking at the competing belief systems in Finnish and German Green parties. Now, in, in this presentation, I might include Sweden later in it too, because there are a lot of connections between Finland, Sweden and Germany, and they have been historically. Uh, but for now, I'll be talking about Finland and Germany. And uh, when I talk about belief systems, I'm, I'm talking of beliefs in the very wide sense of the word, but most especially I'm looking at how human nature was conceptualized and how the relationship between human societies and, and nature and environment were conceptualized in different environmental discourses that the different political parties used. And the point is that, that um, when political goals change, uh, it can, and political discourses change, it can also mean the changing of, of uh, how human nature, for example, is conceptualized. And, um, and it's an integral part mm -hmm. of, of discourses too. Um, and in the case of Greens or the environmental movement in general, it's a particularly, particularly important issue because the environmental movement and also the Green parties themselves explicitly raise these questions like how do we conceptualize our relationship with nature. Um, if I would sum up my research in one sentence, it would be about how moderate market-oriented paradigm was merged into the kind of language that, that started off as quite radical and that wanted to question a market-oriented paradigm. Um, but of course the story is not as simple as this. Uh, there's a, there has been a lot of debate going on and there probably still is a lot of debate going on within the Green Movement and the Green Parties about these issues. Um, so I'm looking at transnational change in green political discourses and beliefs. Well, mostly in the 1990s because that's when the big changes really occurred. Uh, both in green parties and as we'll later see globally as well. And um, the, the way I, I compare the, the parties and their language is based on traditional historical methods of conceptual analysis of key concepts. And uh, the point is to take key concepts, for example, sustainable development, which is something that that the Finnish Green Party started using in the mid-1990s and look at it in the context of action. So not only take into account what sustainable development has traditionally meant, but how it is used in practice, what political goals are sought after it and what, what kind of assumptions are subscribed to the key concepts and, and why. And when we look at the concepts this way, we can find different discourses uh, struggling for power and struggling for influence within political movements. Uh, this is of course political history too, but uh, I would like to make the point that it's not merely political history, it is also about understanding how different ways to conceptualize environmental questions are put into practice in, for example, uh, local parties or national parties and uh, for example the radical companionship paradigm uh, was aimed at dismantling and or reconceptualizing the whole western belief system uh, it's it, it basically came from a grassroots movements discourses that wanted to wanted to point out that for example, individual liberties in production or for industries might be harmful for the environment and environment, environmental responsibility might have to be placed might have to be placed before, for example, economic liberties. And then more moderate green growth paradigm was aimed at adaptation to the status quo beliefs and institutions and was more concentrated on how to work and how to operate within the framework that and the paradigm that we have in place. 
And these are just two examples of environmental discourses that can sometimes be competing with each other within green parties. And well, I would, from here I would like to point out this question why we're competing more radical conceptualizations of human self and the nature abandoned as the environmental discourses changed between these parties. This is also a question I'm trying to answer at least somewhat. So uh, for me there's also contemporary interest in it. Um, we in general have a very hegemonic way of looking at environmental problems through questions of consumption, like how we consume, how, did it, how do we individually purchase products that are eco-labeled and, and so forth, which is of course an important discussion. But the point I would like to make is that environmentalism, when it's often talked about, it's often talked about as the environmental discourse, but it has many different sides to it that are sometimes easy to put together and sometimes not so easy. They can sometimes be very contradictory with each other. So environmentalism is not a singular political discourse and that I believe is, is something that we should take more into account these days as well. Just an example of, of uh, Helsingism, one of, of many uh, titles that talk about environmentalism in the sense of green consumption, which is, well, if not the only, then at least the most visible environmental discourse, I believe, nowadays. And that wasn't always so. When we talk about the rise of the environmental movement in the 60s and the 70s, the key discourses were, well, they were varied, of course, but in general, they were more radical or more more inclined to question the status quo framework than, than to try to uh, adapt to it. And uh, I, I would say that this picture here about the, the factory throwing up smoke in the sky is pretty archetypical, stereotypical picture of the environmental movement. I've seen pictures like that dozens of times when I've been going through uh, through the source material, newspaper archives, and even party archives. So it's a, it's a sort of a, I would say it's even a symbol of how, how the liberties of production were damaging the environment and how environment was seen as a resource storage. And that's what the environmental movement sort of started questioning in their discourses and their activism in the 60s and 70s. Uh, well, it started in the 60s in the US, it, it really hit the, the media awareness in European countries in 1970. So uh, that, that new, pecu new peculiar movement quote is from a German newspaper. Uh, the environment and the environmentalism was at that time given New meaning, the environment of course existed as a word, but it meant a completely different thing. It basically meant the immediate living environment of somebody or something. So suddenly environment started to mean the, the interconnected entity of ecological and climate spheres that, that exists both on local and global levels. And uh, the, the environmental movement was really diverse. It included radical ecologists who were really talking mostly about how the ecology needs to be preserved, eco-feminists and also social greens who were talking a lot about how the human well-being is also in jeopardy when we have a hierarchical uh, system in place, grassroots act activists, organic farmers, even anti-nuclear peace groups who um, were not maybe originally that environmentally concerned, but they were sort of um, merged with the environmental groups as well. And <coughs> what these very different groups had in common was the, the desire to reconceptualize human society, human relationship with nature, at least the Western society. Um, they were critical towards capitalist 
global markets, but also state-led socialism, which was also considered to be equally materialistic. They were primarily anti-growth, anti-modernity, and wanted to give a new definition of well-being where humans were not so much seen as, as individu individualistically separated from, from other humans and from nature. And from that perspective, the nature would, would be seen as a sort of a resource storage, or that was at least what the critics said. But rather, they would want to define well-being in an interconnected way that, that humans need to be more interconnected with each other and with nature. And uh, limits to growth movement was a big thing in the early 70s. And the green growth discussion of the discourse actually was um, coined as a counter-narrative for the limits to growth movement, uh, which uh, the especially the more progressive and environmentally oriented industrialists wanted to present a, an environmental alternative to the limits to growth ideal. Um, these grassroots movements started organizing into parties, and I, I would claim that green parties primarily were originally seen both in Germany and in Finland as the political representatives of the environmental, more wide and general environmental movement or the grassroots movement, which had a lot of political inclinations because it would also mean that the parties were not necessarily that enthusiast, enthusiastically participating in legislative work, but rather wanted to raise discussion of alternatives even on the top political level, and that was more the reason to be there. Uh, the German movement started of, or started organizing around an anti-nuclear movement, which was also very successful in the sense that in Wuhl, for example, they managed to block the, the uh, or entirely cancel the construction of a new, new nuclear plant in the area. Uh, and the German Greens have been strongly, or their identity has been strongly around the anti-nuclear movement. While in Finland, the Koyarvi movement, which these pictures are from, was more about natural protection and a protection of, of well, it was organized around a protection of a lake uh, that was going to be drained, that had a lot of lot of uh, birds there and a lot of ecological diversity, and it was considered to be a really uh, important lake. So the Finnish green movement started off around around natural protection more than anything. So these were really like identities that you can see in party discussions later. Uh, both the Grüne and the Finnish Green Movement uh, also had the really radical conservative ecologists who walked out from the party almost immediately in the 1980s and uh, formed their own smallish parties that didn't really do that well in, in neither of the countries. But they did keep a lot of noise and also got a lot of media att attention despite being rather small. Um, in, in Finland, for example, the, the ecological party promoted the idea that women shouldn't be allowed to decide whether or not to reproduce and uh, things that nowadays perhaps would be considered quite questionable. Well, they were considered questionable even then, of course. Uh, but that also probably explains why these movements or these parties didn't do so well. But I would not be con concentrating that much on those smaller parties that broke away, but rather on the on the bigger, on the green, actual green parties. The Finnish movement actually didn't want to be called the Greens, but uh, of course they had taken the model from Germany, the, the citizens' initiative movements and and grassroots movements ideals were taken from Germany and media connected the movement immediately with the Grüne of the German, uh, German movement. So finally the Finnish Greens gave in and started calling themselves Greens as well. Um, but the Finnish Greens didn't organize themselves into a party until five years after having the first members of parliament, which is a peculiar situation, but they wanted to really establish themselves as an anti-establishment movement. So despite the fact that they were not get, getting the government aid 
monetary aid meant for parties, they still tried to avoid becoming a party. Finally, they had to, because the more ecological side was, was starting to formulate their own party, and, and um, they, they felt they needed to answer that. The German Green Party also considered themselves an anti-party anti party, so, so both these parties were founded on the idea that, that it's the establishment or the, the uh, capitalist market system that the political system is founded on and it needs to be rather protested against rather than to be participated in. Um, so we'll mo mo uh, look more closely to the 1980s Greens and their attempts to reconceptualize the Western belief system in their party work and party discussions and party programs. This is a picture of the German Greens and uh, Petra Kelly and and uh, yeah, yeah, Bastien, who were the leaders of the German Green Movement, and most especially the more radical wing of the party. Um, despite the fact that the most radical ecologists left the party, nevertheless, the Green Party programs contained a lot of what could be called radical ideals, and they even themselves like to call them radical. Uh, the Germans pre presented uh, the idea or the concept of Kreislauf Wirtschaft, which I have now translated into circular economy. Uh, the idea was to create a society in which there is an increasing awareness of the relationship between people and with nature. Uh, instead of the economic system that they considered was in place, that was more about using the nature as a resource to it's using people also as resources rather than being connected, interconnected with them. Uh, so sort of a holistic look at economy. It was very much a protest program. They wanted to raise discussion of the problems of the, of the German model or the European or the Western model. And in reality it was a they, they would, for example, start meeting during parliamentary sessions. So it was their way of making statements. The Finnish Green Alliance had a very similar concept, balanced economy, which meant roughly the same thing. Finding perspectives for balanced interaction between people, societies and the whole natural system. And their goal was also to raise discussion. A good example of this is the Finnish MP Ville Komsi, who would not wear the suit that was expected to be <laughs> to be on him and he would say that it was like a cage and he did not want to participate in this this prison that was meant for the members of parliament um, one transnational sort of um, ideological source for both parties was Ryan Eisler's companionship movement, which especially the Finnish Greens openly mentioned as, as their source. But uh, she was from Austria and would also write in German, so the ideas are pretty clearly also in the German discussion. Her idea was that the Western society is very hierarchical and uh, people are treated hierarchically and nature is also treated hierarchically and that instead of hierarchies, the economy would also need companionship to treat both people and nature better. And uh, what it meant in practice, well, here is comparison between the two, two mm -hmm. programs. So, and the differences are bolded. So uh, it meant that environmental responsibility was allocated to industries, for example, with really strong regulation. The Green parties in practice call for strong regulation, strong emission control as the first step. Um, ecological boundaries was an important concept. They needed to be placed before economic needs of, or economic liberties. And they had explicit demands to dismantle growth-based economy. Also, in the case of German Greens, decentralize it. And that was important, especially in the nuclear power discussion, because nuclear power of course, is very capital intensive uh, form of uh, create energy. So, 
it would mean centralized production. So the point to get rid of nuclear power was also about decentralizing the growth-based economy. And both of these uh, parties had a strong and explicit emphasis on questioning the idea that we have economic liberties towards nature and pointing out that we should have ecological responsibilities rather. This picture is of a shaman and it's an example of how the green movement would also question not, not just in theory, but also in practice, the sort of the Western materialistic way of living. They would bring shamans into their people's gatherings in Finland, and it was sort of an example of how they tried to reconnect with nature, not just on a program, programmatic level, but also, also in, in practice. These, these elements faded away from Finnish Greens after the late 1980s. And in German Greens, the German Greens were more careful not to go into that kind of direction, um, probably because of the, the mysticism that the National Socialists has, had associated with environmentalism in the 1930s. That's the most likely theory why, why it was avoided. This is a picture from Lapland where Petra Kelly and Greg Bastian are visiting a local tent and getting to know local living conditions and the reason I have this here is to point out when we think about why are these programs so familiar well of course they come from a similar ideology and similar kind of grassroots movement but also these people met each other on a regular basis they knew each other and and um, just to mention two names, Petra Kelly and Joska Fischer, two very different kind of thinkers in the German Green Party. Petra Kelly was more of a radical thinker and Joska Fischer wanted to collaborate with, with the prevailing economic system. Both were constantly quoted and met and interviewed in Finnish Green Party newspaper. So that's a good example of people connecting with each other. And the same goes the other way around. The European Green meetings uh, included almost always German and Finnish Green Party leadership who knew each other quite well. Uh, then we come to the, to the 1990s and both in Finland and in Germany there was a rather notable change in news discourses um, that embraced the established conceptual and ideo ideological paradigm of modernity rather than question it. In Finland, sustainable development was coined as a key concept in 1994. Greens were not actually the first party in Finland to do that. The, the Left Alliance got there a few years before then, but of course the background of sustainable development is, is in social democratic thinking originally. The Norwegian Prime Minister Brundtland um, developed the term to connect leftist ideals of having economic growth and also um, social justice with environmental sustainability to combine all these elements together. So in Finland, Greens were critical towards sustainable development in the 80s because it was too economically friendly or market friendly. And it did not, it, it wasn't compatible with the ideal of, uh, of limits to growth. Greens, Finnish Greens were talking of. Uh, and in the 1994 program, the Finnish Greens were really critical on the strong regulation on pollution that they themselves had advocated before. Instead, they wanted now to change the structures of consuming, and they wanted to guide millions of consuming decisions by formulating legislation that would provide possibilities for this ecological taxes, eco-labels for ecological products, and then voluntary market guidance for cooperation. And the point being that it's voluntary, it's not like emission control, like forced regulation. And by this 
Finnish Greens wanted to take environmental leadership internationally, they were afraid that the cross national product would be in ser serious danger if Finland would not make their economy sustainable. Sustainability could be turned into exports, which would lead into green growth, uh, green economic growth. So, extremely different way of talking about environmentalism and a really a, a quickly paced change in huge discourses because as late as 1990 the Finnish Queens had, had written a program that was pretty much the pretty much the opposite of what they had in 1994. So something happened in those four years. In Germany the change took a little longer. Joska Fischer was talking about creating market-friendly environmentalism for Germany already in the 1980s. It wasn't until 2002 when ecological modernization was coined in the Green Party program. However, in 1998, when the Green Party joined the, uh, the government in Germany, they pretty much had already in practice implemented these ideals that they brought in the program in 2002. Uh, so you could pretty much say that this, this all happened by 1998. So it's pretty much similar issues once again. So once again you see that these two countries and, and parties are clearly ideologically connected in their development. Um, freedom of movement and consumer power and program became key concepts that were associated with ecological modernization. And this, I think, is an interesting quote from the party program. In the past, natural protection was the main emphasis in environmental politics, but the future belongs to production and product-integrated environmentalism. It would mean resource-efficient and low-emission technologies and products. And once again, when you compare, it's quite obvious that we are talking about roughly the same thing with a bit of different concepts. For Finns, it was the sustainable development for, for Germans ecological modernization that were used to promote uh, the kind of market-friendly environmentalism where taxation and eco-labels could direct politics. Um, and it also faded out the themes of interaction between humans and nature. So when we are talking about how is human nature relationship conceptualized? Basically, all criticism towards the idea that that there needs to be individual liberties based on top of um, ecological responsibilities, all that discussion faded away pretty much entirely, and it was replaced with discussion of freedom and the idea that the consumers would, if given proper instruments, freely choose the kind of ecological products that would then lead to more ecological uh, life within the system that we live in. Um, these ideas, ecological modernization and sustainable development, were developed in the 1980s. Ecological modernization was originally a German concept, so it's very understandable that the Germans chose that concept. However, they did change it bit from, from what it originally was sort of supposed to mean, because originally ecological modernization wasn't that uh, closely associated with green consumerism. It included, it simply included cooperation with industries, market forces, the state, and then the consumers. So it also had emphasis on industry and production. But that discussion faded away from the Green Party's way of use that concept. In Finland, sustainable development was actually harshly criticized by the Green Party when it first appeared in 1987. The Green Party Parliament group wrote a really, really harsh and critical statement saying that this is, this is too closely associated with the kind of growth ideology that that the green movement is not about. Neither one of these concepts were coined by the, the global green grassroots movement that the, the green parties 
Perth assumed to represent, and that created a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion in the mid-1990s. Well, just to point out that these concepts can be used in very different ways, the EU conceptualization is of sustainable development is more focused on uh, consumption behavior, while the UN version of it is more focused on international trade and, and reducing poverty while doing it in an ecologically sustainable way. The Finnish Green Party interestingly claimed that they, their source is the UN Rio Declaration, but their actual conceptualization of the concept was much closer to the EU version that concentrated on consumer guidance. But you could say that the focus was on both of these conceptualizations. So I'll soon get to the reasons why this all happened. One, one key issue for both Green Parties was the need to get into government, need to affect actual legislation. And um, it comes across in many, many sources and many statements that it would not have been possible to join the government in either one of those countries in the 1990s with, with uh, globally opening economies and globalization. It would not have been possible to to cooperate with other parties in government without making these changes and then to get actually affect the, the environment, environmental legislation. And it was harshly criticized by environmental movements, especially after the Green parties got into the governments and started to make the compromises in practice that, that they, they were already prepared to make in, in the program, programmatic level. Perhaps in, in the German Greens, the most famous case was the question pushed car recycling directive in the European Union, I think it was in 99. Uh, the German automobile industry representatives called Gerhard Schröder, the German Chancellor, Social Democrat, told him that it was not a good thing to have this used car re recycling directive all, all over the European Union, it would be a bad thing for automobile industries. And Gerhard Schröder contacted Joschka Fischer and told him that we need the Greens to vote against this in the, in the EU. And they did, and it created a, sort of a media storm and, and a lot of talk about how much can a party give in on their principles without having, having entirely lost them. On the other hand, a lot of environmental legislation did pass through because the Greens were in government, both in Finland and in Germany. And in Germany also the liberal double citizenship laws for Turkish citizens of Germany. So uh, there were two sides to this, this debate. One interesting example in the case of Finnish Greens is the Finnish Green ABC book. It was um, a basically a party pamphlet written by party members and, and um, published by the party. Sort of as a declaration of, of party principles and the politics that the party was after and the history that the party had had. And the first Green ABC book there came in 1991. It was still the radical era of the Green Party and it contains a lot of stories about activists and how the Green Party represents them and how the Green Party also takes part in activist movements and when they were forced almost against their will to, to take a party uh, benefits from the government when they organized themselves into a party in 1988 they spent the money on a party bus that would travel in rock festivals and it would have information about the state of Finnish forests inside the bus so people could learn about that instead of spending the money on, on for example, uh, for example, uh, election advertisement or something like that, which they actually did spend money on, but, but they didn't want to really give a lot of noise about that at that time. But then, just a couple of years later, the Greens realized that they had changed their program and their political goals and their ideology pretty much entirely, so it was a bit embarrassing to have this book 
published just a couple of years earlier, so the Greens published Green ABC Book 2, which pretty much is like a completely opposite book of Green ABC Book 1. It contains stories of, of, or narratives of how important it is to have uh, economically sustainable environmentalism and and uh, a lot of discussion about that. Here is, I think, a very descriptive quote from Green ABC Book 2. In a suddenly changing world, the meaningfulness of action, people's morale and ecology ought not be strict dogmas, but rather frameworks and rules of thumb. Beginners are allowed a bundle of principles, but the Greens have lost their innocence as a movement. The value of the movement lies only in its utility to solve practical problems appearing in the here and now. Rules of thumb, of course, don't sound very elegant, but if the practicality of them replaces the principal phrases, the outcome will be more sustainable politics. So that's a direct quote from one of the articles in the book by a green active member. Um, so I'm going to take a closer look at some of the arguments for and against the change. And uh, I have some notions from the German Greens, but I'm mostly concentrating on Finnish Greens, mostly because that's what I've studied so far. And uh, this picture is from the Vihre Alanka magazine, which was the Finnish Green Party magazine, although it worked independently from the party. But the same discourses that change in the parties also change in the magazine simultaneously at the very same time. So in the 1980s, the, the magazine is all about nature protection. Most of the pictures are from either from nature or from factories polluting. And in 1992, the, the whole imagery turned upside down. And I think this is a perfect, this picture is a perfect symbol to, to present the change. When earlier activism and nature protection had been portrayed in only in a positive light, then suddenly this was the sort of the laughable image that people had of Greens that was not true because this was the reality that Greens were just regular urban people driving their cars and being worried about the environment as normal. Normal people. Uh, coincidentally, one year earlier in 1991, the election barometers had demonstrated that that shockingly most Green voters were urban well-educated adults, which, which the Greens had not been that well aware of before. So this, this, this is also one of the reasons why possibly the discourse has changed. In the argument there were basically two sides. There were the reformists who wanted pragmatic pragmatic changes and then the ecologists who were defending the radical position from a more ecological point of view. Um, so arguments for the change by some of the reformists and, and they themselves like to be called reformists so, so, or reformers, so that's why I'm using the term here. In Finland, Osmo Soirinvara was the first one. He came from the Liberal Party which dissolved and it was a center, moderate center party, and he was a member of the youth organization in that party and brought a lot of the liberal party ideals to the Finnish Green Party. And in the 80s, he was in the marginal ideologically, even though as a person he was a, a big player already in the 1980s in the Green Party, but ideologically his ideas were in the marginal. He wanted from the early 1980s onwards to merge environmentalism with, with market-friendly ways of thinking and not to fight against the current paradigm but rather to, to embrace it and work from that point onwards to actually get more things done. So he claimed that all or nothing politics will re result in all nothing politics. So, so you get nothing if you, if you are too radical which was an actual concern for a lot of Greens, especially after 1991, when the Greens in Finland won the elections. They got 10 seats in the parliament and they participated in discussions of joining the, possibly the government for the first time. And they were very quickly told that, that they were too radical to get into the government. There was, of course, 
Soviet Union was collapsing and there was a, a depression, economic depression in Finland, so it might also have been really difficult to talk about anti-growth ideals during a time of depression. Um, but in 1991, actually a year or two before that, in 1989-1990, these ideals were getting presented more often in the Vihreanaka magazine, which demonstrate the, the beginning of the, of the argument. Even though Osmo Soilinvar had been talking about these issues for a longer time, it wasn't properly discussed or debated until, I'd say, starting from 1989 onwards in Finland. In Germany, these issues had been debated for a longer time, mostly because of Joska Fischer, who was, who was basically leading the, the so-called realist side, as they themselves like to be called. Um, but he also did not represent the, the sort of the mainstream ideal, ideals of the party until in the 1990s. So for him, the world is, was not a right place for dreamers. He said that I don't have visions, I have goals. Uh, he always has very, very quotable one-liners. Uh, and then Pekka Haavisto, still active in Finnish party politics. He was the first minister of national government in the EU area. He said when he was criticized, or the Greens were criticized in 1995, for making too many compromises by the NGOs who still saw the Greens as their representatives. Pekka Haavisto said that nothing would have been accomplished with the attitude of the NGOs. So once again, pragmatical point of view, if we want to get environmental legislation passed, then we need to make compromises. That was the idea behind it. Um, and in the case of, of Finland, uh, for example, a lot of forests were protected, but also NGOs complained that not nearly as much as the Greens had uh, demanded when they joined the government. Then another pragmatic reason, appealing to moderate voters, like I said, the Greens had realized that young, urban, well-educated voters were their main, uh, main electorate, and that was also true in, in uh, Germany. And both in Finland and in Germany, youth barometers have revealed that liberal and internationalist and individualistically oriented ideals became more common in the 1990s in that group. So that would also explain why these changes needed to be made. And some Greens said it out loud, though in German Green Party program it was said out loud that a freedom-oriented economic system has to be maintained in order to get the ecological policies approved by the public. This is almost directly from the mouth of Joska Fischer, who had said the same thing already 10 to 15 years earlier. I think in 1989, I've seen one quote where he says almost exactly word to word the very same thing. And becoming normal was also the issue for Finnish Greens. Credibility in the eyes of the regular voter, the, the family, uh, dad or mom who drives the car and is worried about the environment, not so much about the radical uh, activists. And finally, this was an interesting thing I noticed that keeps coming up again and again. There is sort of a coming of age story, which I call it. They, they don't use the term coming of age story, but they, the Greens, the um, moderate Greens talk about maturity, losing innocence. Losing innocence was a really important thing. Innocence was apparently a bad thing. But I, would, I would suppose it would mean like being a bit immature and not understanding how the world works. And Pauli Valimäki, even in Green ABC book two, even called the, the radical standpoint a children's disease, which, which the Greens had finally overcome. Pekka Sauri, who became the chairman of the party in 1994 party conference, where these changes were finally finalized, uh, said that the goal with the new program was to create an identity which meant striving for sustainability with the methods of market economy instead of working against 
so reaching maturity. Also, interestingly, the the opposite side of the discussion, the more ecologically oriented Greens, use the same kind of terminology, the, the, but in a negative sense, like growing up or becoming mature was a negative thing. Uh, in one article from 1989, I think one green ecological green warned the green movement of becoming middle-aged and middle-angry, keski ikäinen, keski äkäinen in Finnish, which is sort of a play on words. But uh, wearing a suit and, and a suitcase would be a bad thing because because then the greens would lose their perspective on questioning the prevailing status quo, which was their reason of, of existing in the first place for the more ecologically oriented Greeks. Um, arguments against the change. Oh, this text here is accidentally in Finnish, but Ulla Glötzer is an interesting character. She was a former vice chairman of the Greens while the Greens were going through this transition period where their, where their party course and ideology changed. And she left the party soon afterwards, and this, this quote here is from 1998. Uh, for, for parties like Green Alliance and the Left Alliance, staying in government has meant and will mean the selling out of their own principles and ideological values, as well as betraying their voters. So quite a lot of harsh words from the former vice chairman of the party just a couple of years later. So this coming of age story, this maturing story was for, for the more ecologically oriented Greens a selling out story. The Greens sold out on their principles in, in their opinion. Also, simply ecological issues were often talked about. Maximizing economic activity was the reason to oppose the, the EU. Uh, the Greens for a long time, which is not very known nowadays, Greens for a long time in Finland were one of the most vocal anti-EU parties. But the reformist side was more pro-EU, so, so the Greens eventually also became pro-EU. Um, so you have two different different sides, very different forms of argumentation. Interestingly, the, the reformists did not talk of ecological issues. They could have, because they could have said that it's good for the ecology to get into government and actually get legislation passed, but they just concentrated talking on the pragmatic issues, how to get actually into the government and what needs to be done in order to get there. Um, I will very quickly go this last section about the wider global context, the green economic discussions on the EU level. So. Um, um, Margaret Thatcher was the first one to present the ideals of green consumerism in the EU level, starting from 1989. And the background was that the, uh, the, the environmental movement had had some success in getting strict uh, industry regulation, emission regulation passed. And in 1989, uh, for example, in European man manufactured cars, they had um, these catalysts um, that were forced to be installed in cars from that point onwards. And some European politicians noticed that it was hurting the economy and industry competitiveness. So in the EU level, first in 1993, Environmental Action Plan, and then in 1995 in the Molitor Report, the EU started demanding or, well, uh, requesting, would be a better word, a simplified regulation, a deregulated environmental politics that wouldn't hurt industry so much. And the solution for this was uh, green consumerism, where consumers would be presented with Options. So this was the framework on the EU level, and the sovereign consumer was the hegemonical, hegemonical political agent in these discussions, first in the right parties, then in the left parties, and finally in the green parties, uh, to preserve the industry competitiveness. That's the original reason why these discussions emerged in the top political level in the EU. And the green parties, of course, they were not necessarily agreeing with these ideals 
but it was the paradigm, new paradigm that they had to embrace in order to get things done like they themselves said. Um, and in the process, environmental agency and responsibility became reallocated to the consumers. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm at the end of my presentation. So as final conclusions, um, differences in environmental political discourses have also been differences of beliefs. And when we just look at the political goals, we don't necessarily grasp the magnitude of the change. We also need to look at the deeper ideological incarnations, the beliefs, how human nature relationships are perceived. And we see that these are really two very different ways to, to uh, look at environmental political issues. And whether or not it was a necessary practical change or, or selling out to the system that they were set out to, to redefine, that depends on the perspectives. But for our time, uh, I believe that the environmental narratives, even the one that have become hegemonic, um, need to be looked at from the lens of having ideological, political, economical affiliations. And those affiliations can be made more visible with historical research. So uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.